thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank UJ, the department, uh, especially LB, for um, inviting a lonely person like me onto such a platform. Um, and I had a paragraph to open my whole talk where I was making all kinds of disclaimers about my not knowing anything about education theory and the rest of it, but she assures me that I can just talk and not have to um, apologize for not being a specialist on anything. Um, and I just, I, I really um, am grateful for the platform because of the work which I'm trying to do in, in Grahamstown um, in, in terms of trying to intervene for, in my community where the education crisis is concerned. Okay, so skip the whole disclaimer paragraph. <laughs> Let me give you some background. In 2009 and 2010, my friends and I uh, found ourselves feeling quite frustrated with um, the way things were going in our community education activism. Oh, has everyone seen the title of the talk? <laughs> I don't have to repeat that. All right, we we're feeling very frustrated by um, the community activism, activism that we were doing. I'm part of a small group of people called Save Our Schools and Community that operates in Grahamstown and in Port Elizabeth. Now, we were working in schools and really started feeling that we were being messed around by the teachers and district officials who were treating us with a very paternalistic kind of contempt. And I got really jaded when uh, we were meant to meet a principal to discuss tutoring for his grade 12 and he told us to meet him at the parking lot of the supermarket because it was the 20th and school had broken up early. Now that for me was just too much. And um, really, I, we then I just said, let's just stop what we're doing. Stop. Where we could stop, just stop. And start reflecting on what is happening. And I really wanted to know why there was this perplexing and embarrassing behavior from these black adults when it came to education. Now, I won't uh, rehash all the problems in the education crisis. I think everyone in South Africa is familiar with them around literacy, numeracy, and the rest of it. Um, and I think what people want are solutions. And I think we can all agree that there's no single one solution to the education crisis. However, I think that there are fundamentals that we need to discuss because these guide our interventions and our activism and the positions that we take in relation to policy. So, I was asking myself this question. How did education come to be treated with such disrespect and such disdain by the educated black professionals administering it? And why on earth were no parents rising up? And I felt that in order to answer this question um, intuitively in myself, but if I want to answer this question, then I need to step outside of the mainstream media debates and outside of civil society debates and pay attention to black communities and to observe what I can there as an insider. And now let me just describe what I thought was lacking in the mainstream debate. Or rather, what was the problem with it? Firstly, I, I felt that the mainstream debate, um, and when I say mainstream, I mean mostly media um, uh, debate. I felt that it was excluding and marginalizing perspectives that related directly to how the crisis unfolds in communities itself. For example, the tension that we've seen in, in Prabhu between the black community and the colored community, that's happening in a lot of places. And I've been talking about that for quite a while, and a lot of people are. And what's happening in those places is that the colored schools are facing a lot of pressure, financing pressure, because of the state's funding mechanisms. Now with the influx of black kids, and a lot of black kids not being able to pay the school fees, as well as the unemployment in the colored areas, the state funding mechanisms have treated for a long time colored schools as if they are middle class, creating a situation where they're underfunded. So there's a lot of tension. And when you try to work with a colored school, I mean, it's just a lot of racism, because there's a lot of division now within the working class, as these kinds of discussions that are not happening in the media. I feel that the dominant strength in the mainstream debate around education are, of course, the fact that we have a school shortage, and there's an unemployment crisis, and so education can fix this, that's one discussion. Another one is about the corruption, the maladministration, the poor governance, 
the resource inequality, the ANC's failure to tackle these things. Then there's another debate and discussion around policy, curriculum, language, and the culture of teaching and learning. These are all things that are being discussed. In my view, these discussions are focusing mainly on what I call the policy crisis and the administration crisis. But in this talk, I want to put forward the provocative suggestion that the real crisis in education is social in nature. And that um, this education crisis is just one dimension of many convulsions that are happening in the black community at this point in time. I'd like to argue that there's no consensus in the black community on what education actually means and what role it actually occupies in society. Is, this, is education a prize that we need to pursue because it's intellectually and personally stimulating? Or is it something we pursue because we want a job? Will it get us a job? And if it doesn't get me a job, will it help me to start a business? Should we be studying because we enjoy it or because it's going to return an investment? And if it's going to return an investment, should it return it fast or slow? You know, long term or short term? Um, and I just thought I should make the example that when I started doing, when I started studying, you know, everyone in my family was proud, you know? Yeah, your first degree. <laughs> you should get a degree. Honors degree. Hey, you've got two degrees. Hi, then you get to master's. Hi, bro. Hi, when are you going to stop studying? <laughs> oh, no, now, I, now I'm really, really, like, I can't explain that I've been doing a PhD for four years. How are you going to explain this? Your grandmother's just like, when are we going to get some money? <laughs> you know? That's what she keeps saying to me, I'm going to take the food now, what's the guy do? You know, if you buy a lady. And I just think people think I should be now working in government and, you know, earning a lot of money. Maybe I should be. <laughs> but I, I mean, I pose these questions not for fun, but because they actually inform what I'm doing in education, or trying to do it. I don't want to get lost in analysis. I just want to reflect. Now let me just turn to my title very quickly. Look at the phrase there that says, the things we black people desire. Uh, on one level, the phrase is informed by that black idea of tendency, like to like things, which sort of means to hanker after things, material things, in a crass, you know, way. But really, I was also looking at a deeper set of aspiration, you know, something that we desire, you know, it's a physical, it's a physical desire, it's, it's an emotional desire, you know, when you desire something, one of the things that black people desire, What's the relationship between those desires and education? That will tell, tell us something. Um, also, in, in terms of positioning myself in, uh, as we, so I'm saying we and I'm saying black people, I'm trying to follow on Mathej's way of doing analysis, which is you try and step away from the white gates, try and step away from a Eurocentric way of looking at it, which is what happens in the media all the time. You end up black people being analyzed as though they are like aliens to their own thing. Okay, <laughs> so, and I think that's half of the problem with debate in this country. So I'm putting myself in a situation where I feel like I'm actually, uh, I have something in common with black people. Whatever the contradictions that entails, because obviously there's no such thing as a shared reality entirely. Um, and I'm not claiming a special privilege by situating myself in black society, I'm actually just taking a methodological position towards this issue. Now there's um, three issues which I believe provide a sociological account for why the ANC has failed or has struggled to reform education in South Africa. And explain why communities have not yet burnt down government offices or taken a few officials hostage over there. Because really we should have by now. And I feel that of all the problems that we faced um, with the legacy of white, with white rule, education was the one thing we could have actually fixed. And the reason we, ha and the reason we could have fixed it is because it's such a fluid area. It's so inherent to life. It's not like it's you know, building infrastructure. Education is much more flexible. What it means is political will to create far-reaching reform. So now my argument today is basically this, that the political will that we needed to do something flexible was trumped or is being trumped by a very conservative class advancement agenda. And that this advancement, this class agenda is, you can see it in the dramatic shifts in the black communities since the demise of apartheid. In a nutshell, education was